Let's pray together. Father, we thank you very much for our Bible study. And thank you for your goodness. Thank you because you have kept us alive so that we can hear you speak to us directly from your word we ask him that tonight you speak to every heart in jesus name we pray that your word will enrich our lives bless us lord as we study your word reveal jesus to us more and more today in jesus name we pray we're beginning this study in the book of revelation and you need to open your Bible now to Revelation chapter 1. Today we're looking at verses 1, 2, and 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which he gave to his servants, which he gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must surely come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel, unto his servant John, who bore record of the word of God, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all the things, all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The title of our study today is The Revelation of Christ's Future Glory. The Revelation of Christ's Future Glory. These three verses I've read to you. They introduce us to the book of Revelation. This book of Revelation is the last book in the Holy Bible. And there is no other book in the Bible that has such depth and such richness as does the book of Revelation. It's a book in which all things in the Bible find an echo, find a reverberation, and finds a consummation. What I mean is this. What begins in Genesis and continues throughout the books of the Bible finds its end, its consummation in Revelation. Follow me. In Genesis, you have the commencement, the beginning of heaven and earth. Whereas in Revelation you have the consummation, the climax, the conclusion of heaven and earth. And in Genesis you have the entrance of sin and the curse. In, in Revelation you have the end of sin and the curse. In Genesis you have the dawn of Satan and his activities. In Revelation you have the doom of Satan and his activities. In Genesis it's the tree of life relinquished. But in Revelation, you have the tree of life regained. In Genesis, we have death entering. But we have in Revelation, death as it exits. In Genesis, sorrow begins. But in Revelation, you have sorrow banished. In, Re in Genesis, Savior, the Savior is promised. But in Revelation, the Savior is preeminent. That means then, as a sort of the book of Revelation, You'll come across everything that began in Genesis. Everything that continues throughout the rest of the books of the Bible. And there is no subject you can study in any other part of the Bible that you will not have a similitude, a symbol, or a shadow in the book of Revelation. The book Revelation itself focuses on Christ's coming in glory with all the, of the attendant events and circumstances for the first time when Jesus Christ came into this world. You know the story in the Gospels. I was born of a virgin and he lived a sinless life and he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil and then he saved souls, he prayed for people, he touched the word of God. But that first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ ended on the cross. Because he came at that time in humiliation, and he died in humiliation. He died for our salvation. But now he's coming again. When he comes again, he will not be coming in humiliation. He'll be coming in glorious exaltation. The first time he came, many saw him in his humiliation, in lowliness, and humility, and meekness, like a servant coming to serve us. But the next time he appears... 
the next time he comes every eye shall see him and all will see not humiliation but exaltation and at that time it will not just be for our salvation it will be for our glorification and that's why it's so important as we come to this book of revelation to study as we look at these three verses today the three verses divide naturally into three parts verse one verse two and verse three and there are three subtitles you have in the study today number one the revelation of jesus christ the revelation of jesus christ number two the record of john about christ then number three the reward of the justified just christians we come to number one in number one we see the revelation of jesus christ i want you to look at verse one and you see this right there it says the revelation of jesus christ the revelation of jesus christ that gives you the title immediately that means then as we have it in the opening verse of the book this is the revelation of christ the word revelation means uncovering unveiling revealing discovering it's a discovery this then is the uncovering and the unveiling the revealing the manifestation of the incomparably glorious son of god the lord jesus christ as you think about that word revelation and you see its meaning and you see the various things contained in that word to reveal to unveil to uncover to show to the people the things that had been hidden then you understand actually what we're going to have in the book of revelation in second thessalonians chapter one second thessalonians chapter one i'm reading from verse seven we're following through on the word revelation second thessalonians chapter one verse seven and to you who are troubled rest with us when the lord jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not god and that obey not the gospel of our lord jesus christ it tells you here that the lord jesus christ in verse 7 he shall be revealed but he's looking into the future it's looking at the time when he will come in glory he'll come in power he'll come with his angels and at that time he'll not come as a meek gentle lamb he'll come as a judging lion of the tribe of judah and then he says at that time he will come in flaming fire and he'll take vengeance upon the people that reject the gospel upon those that do not know the lord in experiential salvation as you look at verse 10 of this same chapter it says when he shall come to be glorified in the saints and to be admired in all them that believe because a testimony among you was believed in that day it says the day is coming when christ will be so glorified the day is coming when he will shine forth in his mighty glory and then it says at that time he'll be glorified exalted and beautiful it will be in great splendor in the midst and the sight of all his children of all his disciples of of all his followers in matthew chapter matthew chapter 16 as we think about the revelation of the lord jesus christ who reveals christ to us how do we know christ in glory and in power matthew chapter 16 matthew chapter 16 i'm reading from verse 15 it says unto them but whom say ye that i am even in christ's earthly ministry he needed to know whether they had a revelation already of who he was and therefore he said unto them who do men say that i the son of man am 
And then some say you are this, you are this, you are that. You are Jeremiah, you are one of the prophets, or you are John the Baptist, or you are Elijah. Then he said, those people, they do not have any revelation about me at all. What do you say? Whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Here we are told that he took the Father Almighty God himself to reveal the Lord Jesus Christ unto Peter. And he takes the Father himself to also reveal the Son of God, Jesus Christ, unto us. If you just say, look at that revelation once again, revelation once again, and you're looking at verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, that even this revelation of the glory and the splendor of Jesus Christ, of the exaltation, of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is still God the Father, the mighty one in heaven, that is giving this revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ unto his servants. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And then he sent and signified it by his angels unto his servant John in Luke chapter 17 Luke chapter 17 we're reading from verse 30 Luke 17 30 even thus shall it be in the day when the son of man is revealed when Jesus Christ walked the earth and he walked the streets and the shores of Galilee the people did not fully know who Jesus Christ was. But then the Lord Jesus Christ was saying, telling the people, the time is coming. The day is coming. The period is coming in the timetable of the Almighty God. When the Son of God, when the Son of Man will be revealed unto the whole of humanity, but especially revealed unto his own people. And Peter the Apostle, who had been an eyewitness, of the glory of the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration. He tells us that this Jesus Christ had been revealed and is still going to be revealed. There's still a day coming, a time coming when we'll have a revelation, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13. First Peter 1, 13. Wherefore, get up your loins, the loins of your mind, and be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought upon you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, you've seen a lot, you've known a lot, you've received a lot of the Lord Jesus Christ. But get up your loins and get ready for the coming of the Lord because that time is coming when there will be the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ was on this earth, the revelation that people had of him was quite, was limited. It was limited to the power he was able to manifest, limited to the power of his name, the authority of his name, the majesty of his name. But when he comes in the, in the revelation, that he is in the glory that is to come, then we'll have the fullness of revelation given unto us. As we look at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. When the curtain was drawn aside. And the disciples of Jesus Christ saw. In a brief moment. They saw the glory. The coming glory of the son of God. They were surprised. But then it was just to be for that short limited time. In Luke chapter 9, reading from verse 28, and it, came, and it came to pass, about and eight days after these things, he took Peter and John and James and went up into the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. 
And his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his disease, that is, of his death, which he shall accomplish at Jerusalem. They were told as that revelation was going on, that Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, suddenly they woke up and they saw this glory, this splendor of the Lord Jesus Christ. What surprise came upon them? What shock came upon them? Because they had been seeing the Lord Jesus Christ and they had never seen any glory like this, any beauty, any splendor like this. It shocked them. It surprised them. Waking up, they saw. And it says, they saw his glory. And the two men, Elijah and Moses, Moses and Elijah, that stood with him. And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. When you see, when you see the coming glory of heaven. And what it will be when everything will come to an end here on earth. And we come to the consummation, the climax and the conclusion of the whole scene. And we'll see his glory. And we enter with him into that glory. You will like to be there forever. I pray you will be there. But at that time, Peter just forgot about everything else. And he said, Master, Lord Jesus, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles. He spoiled it. Because if the Lord will allow you to make tabernacles and houses or buildings in heaven, heaven will not be heaven. If you will have to do the building and the structuring and, and the everything, then heaven will not be heaven because heaven will not be good enough if you have to use your skill, human skill, earthly skill, to build anything for us to live in there. It will be built by the Lord himself. I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, there ye may be also. Father... Show me the glory, the glory that I had with you before the beginning, the foundation of the world, even before the garden of Eden was made, and before man lost the glory, and before man lost the beauty, and all the provision of the Lord. That glory had been there. And so if man will have to build tabernacles for us to live in there, that will not be heaven. It will be built by the Almighty God himself, because they sought a city whose builder and maker is God himself. That's heaven. And so it says, let us make us three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias, not knowing what he said. While he does speak, there came a cloud and overshadowed them and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. The father revealed the son to them there more than ever before. And he told them once again, This is my only begotten son. There's something you are going to do. There's something you need to do. You must do. If you're going to be in that glory forever and ever, hear him. Luke chapter 10. From verse 21. Luke chapter 10, verse 21. This is talking about the 70 disciples that had gone out and they went out on an evangelistic mission. And they came back to report the victory, the success in ministry that the Lord had granted them, that the name of the Lord had accomplished. Back up to verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. The 70, they returned and they told the Lord how his name in their mouth had been mighty. And even the demons were subject unto them. Then in verse 21, and in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou has hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and has revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. 
Do you see here the Lord Jesus Christ praising the Father, glorifying the Father, honoring the Father? And he said, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent. And then he uses the word reveal. You have revealed each unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seems right, good, appropriate in your sight. All things are delivered unto me of the Father, of my Father. And no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father. And who the Father is but the Son. And he to whom the Son will reveal him. And you'll see the two-way revelation. It's the Father that reveals Jesus Christ to us. And it is Jesus Christ that reveals the Father unto us. That's why if, you, if Jesus Christ does not reveal God to you, you cannot know God. All those religions that do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they will not have a revelation of Jesus Christ. They will not have a revelation of the Father, of God in heaven. They might be serving a kind of God, but the true God, the God of mercy, and the God of love, and the God of salvation, and the God that is the father of the people that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they will not know that father until they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus reveals the father unto them. Neither will you know the son very well, the depth, and the riches, and the length, and the height of his glory, and his splendor, and his grace in your life, until the father reveals the son unto you. The revelation of Jesus Christ in verse 23 it tells us and he turned him unto his disciples and said privately blessed are the eyes which see these things that you see for I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them as we go through the book of Revelation, that's what you'll discover. That there are many things you'll find in the book of Revelation. That kings and princes and scientists and poets and great men and politicians of this world, the things that will be mysterious to them. But the Lord has revealed them in his word. And you come week after week and study after study, the revelation will be revealed, will be given to you, and you will have. All the blessing that the revelation will bring to you in Jesus' name. The Gospels reveal Christ. But those Gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they reveal Christ in his first coming, that is, in his humiliation. But this book we're studying starting today, the book of Revelation, reveals Christ in his second coming, in his exaltation. Christ is a great theme of the book of Revelation. One, it's revealed to us as a risen, glorified Son of God in the midst of his church. Two, it's revealed to us as a lamb in heaven. He was the lamb on earth that died for our sins. But as we see him on the throne, the lamb that was slain, who was and is and will be forevermore, is revealed publicly with invested authority and power. Number three, it's revealed as the king of kings and the lord of lords. It'll not be the lowly Christ that people were pushing about and kneeling to the cross and saying, tell us who are smitten you. But this will be the king in authority and the lord of the whole universe when you see him revealed in the book of Revelation. And it will be revealed, number four, as the judge upon the throne of the universe. The judge upon the throne of the universe because it says the father has committed transferred all judgment into his hand number five he'll be revealed as the root and the offspring of david to sit on the throne of david and to rule on the people of israel and he will rule and reign forever and ever he'll be the bright and the morning star number six is revealed as the ruler over all the kingdoms of the earth. You'll come across this as we study through the book of Revelation. That all the kingdoms of this world, they become the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. Then number seven is revealed as the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The one who is, who was, and who is to come. The first and the last. 
as you look at the book of Revelation, then you will find out that we're going to see a glorious vision, a glorious revelation of Jesus Christ in his majesty, in his sovereignty, in his splendor, in his eternal glory. This book of Revelation is not only giving us revelation concerning Christ, it gives us another thing. It's giving us revelation from Christ. That is, there are many, many things that are given us in this book. And it's coming from Christ himself. Christ in this book reveals the spiritual condition of every Christian. Christ in this book reveals the spiritual condition of every individual, saint or sinner. Christ in this book reveals the condition of every church. And reveals the necessity of love. He revealed that when he was here on earth, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And then as he comes from glory, and he speaks to every Christian, speaks to every heart, and speaks to the whole church from glory. He reveals the necessity of love. Number three, he reveals the importance, indispensability, the unchanging, unbending, uncompromising decision and con condition of holiness in his church. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. As he speaks from glory, he reveals again that whoever we are, wherever we are, whenever we are ministering, and whatever it is we're doing, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And you'll see the way he reveals that as we go into the book of Revelation, the emphasis he puts on holiness, holiness of heart. Holiness of life, holiness in your appearance, holiness in your comportment, holiness in your interaction, holiness in your relationship, holiness through and through. The condition, indispensable, uncompromised condition of fellowship with the Lord. Not only that, number four, he reveals the promise of eternal inheritance for the overcomer. He that overcomes, he says, he will inherit all things. Number five, he reveals the ultimate triumph and reward of the overcomers that the overcomers they'll conquer and triumph over everything and then number six it reveals the final political setup in this world not just for each country not just for the continent of africa but for all the whole world number seven it reveals the end of human history that history will come to an end and the way people are living, what you see of it now in the world, everything one day will come to an end. It reveals, number eight, the program and the power of the coming Antichrist. It also reveals, number nine, the final triumph of Christ over the Antichrist, of Christ over Satan, and of Christ over evil. And then he reveals, number 10, the victory of Christ, of Christ's power over all forces, human forces or demonic forces. He also reveals the final judgment on Satan and a final end of sin. Number 12, he reveals also the final judgment on sinners. Whosoever was not found reaching in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And then number 13, he reveals the glories of Christ's kingdom on earth, his millennial reign. Number 14, he reveals the ultimate triumph of Christ's saving purpose. As you think about the book of Revelation, then it's all revelation, revelation, revelation. The Lord revealing and revealing and revealing. And I, I hope you will not miss the studies. And I pray you will not miss the studies. Because these studies will just turn your life around. Then you'll just, you'll just be happy that you are a Christian. You'll be confident in the Lord. You will know there is no other decision to take. The best thing that can happen to you is just to be a Christian. I come to point number two. The record of John about Christ. The record of John about Christ. I come back to Revelation chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things, things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel 
unto his servant, who will bear record, who will bear record of the watch of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Here we're told that John bore record of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been a faithful and a loyal witness. John had been bearing record of the Lord Jesus Christ, bearing witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of John and in his epistles, he witnessed and he bore record of Christ's incarnation and of Christ's humiliation and of our salvation through his sacrifice and of our sanctification through Christ's atoning blood. Having borne witness of his humiliation, he now needs to bear witness of his exaltation and glorification. He's not given a greater privilege. Isn't that how God works? That when you have made use of your two talents, then he gives you more. And when you've made use properly, appropriately, acceptably of your five talents, he gives you more. That's the way the Lord works. John had been faithful in the gospel according to St. John. And every detail, every word that the Lord wanted him to record, he had recorded everything. Not only that, in the first epistle of John, every jot and every title, every word and every sentence, every statement, the Lord wanted him to make, he made everything faithfully. And in 2nd John, and in 3rd John, he had persecution, he had problem. But I did not make him to withdraw and take back what had been revealed to him. And then the Lord said, if you have been faithful in a little thing, you will have the privilege of having a greater responsibility. And it's like that today in the house of the living God. Well, you're given a small thing to do, apparently. But that's not small. That's not small. John, is that small? No, sir. Because, after all, Peter is my colleague and my companion. And how much revelation did he give to the church? First Peter, second Peter. Can I say then it's too small when he gave me chance to write the gospel according to John? And then first John, second John, third John, that's not small. In that important assignment, the first assignment that the Lord has given you, be faithful. And then the Lord will be able to give you a greater privilege and a greater revelation that you'll give unto the people of God. Have you noticed in that verse 1 it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, number one, which God gave unto him. Number two, to show unto his servants. To show not only to those seven churches that you read about is in a second chapter and a third chapter, but to all his servants. Number three, he sent and he signified that revelation by his angel. And then number four, we are told, unto his servant John, who then bore record. Number one, you can see the divine source. Number two, you can see the declaring servant. The divine source, that's God himself. This revelation came from the Lord, from the Father, and came to Jesus Christ. And then from Jesus Christ, it was sent through the angel then to John. And John was the declaring servant. This full disclosure, unveiling, revelation of Christ's glorification came from God. Christ then sent it through an angel with sight, sign, symbols. You will find, as you read the book of Revelation, a lot of symbols and a lot of pictorial things, sights to see, and signs as well. This is the only book in the Bible sent through an angel, directly from an angel. An angelic ministry appears frequently in this book of Revelation. Angels are mentioned in many, many chapters. In chapter 4, in chapter 5, in chapter 6, in chapter 7, in chapter 8, in chapter 9, in chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 17, chapter 18, chapter 19, chapter 20. Angels mentioned over and over. In fact, in this book of Revelation, angels appear more than 60 times in the book. John was trusted, was a trusted servant 
who was chosen to reveal and declare the revelation to the church, to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. The major part of the book is prophetic. That's why it says to show the things that they have not happened yet, they have not fully happened yet, they will happen. They will shortly and shortly come to pass. Uh, those words, shortly come to pass, just tells us that the things in this book are imminent. They are quickly to happen. They are soon to happen. They will definitely happen, certainly happen. But they have not happened yet, but they're imminent. That's why the Lord says, Behold, I come quickly. When he says quickly, he's not computing time the way you compute time. He doesn't track on time the way you reckon on time. Because you shouldn't be ignorant of this one thing. That one day, of the Lord. It says a thousand years and a thousand years is just like one day. The prophecy in this revelation will and must certainly come to pass. Not a syllable of this prophecy will fall to the ground the record is true. The fulfillment is certain. But uh, you will see, let's, let's go into the Bible and see that as John was bearing record, it's always, it's always been like that. He bought record before, now he's bearing record again. In John chapter 21, John chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 24. This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And that is, he wrote all these things we read from John chapter 1 to verse 21. Is the revelation of the Lord that was given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. And how many people have been brought into real salvation experience through the testimony of, the, of John. And how many people have been brought into real conversion, transformation of life through the book of John. That is the gospel according to St. John. It looks like many people, if they don't do any other part of the New Testament, they know the parts that John wrote. Think about it. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Revelation. And as many as received him. That's John. To them he gave power, he gave the right, he gave the authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And you remember that verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God has not sent a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You remember how John has been bearing testimony that now we believe, not just because of your word, we've seen him ourselves, we've heard him ourselves, and we know of his shorty days. He is the Son of God. He bore witness. You know the witness that is bought to the Lord Jesus Christ, that the day is coming. When the dead in the grave, they will hear the voice of the Son of Man, and the people that hear, they will rise from the grave. The just unto the resurrection of life, and the unjust, and the sinners, and the bad people, Unto the resurrection of damnation. And you know the record he bought that when he said that the word I speak unto you, they are spirit and life indeed. John had been bearing record of the power of the word of God, of the transformation that we have in the word of God, and of the possibility of coming to drink at the fountain of living waters. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, that he that believes on me, he will drink. If he's thirsty, he will drink, and out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Is the revelation that John had been giving us, and then at the end of that revelation, of the record he bore, he said all these things are written Jesus Christ actually did many more miracles in the sight of his disciples 
But these are written that ye might believe that this Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through him. He's been bearing record. And now he comes, and he bears a greater record, a higher record of the glory, of the beauty, of the splendor, of the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ when he will come again. First John, look at this. First John chapter 1. In First John chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 1. It says, in First John 1, Verse 1, here's the record of John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, and with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And you'll see what John is telling us, that he submitted himself to the Lord, giving himself to the Lord, and has been bearing witness. I'm looking at John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 7. For there are three, three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. The word, that's Jesus Christ. And it tells us that there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. There are three that bear witness in the earth. The spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he gave, which he has testified of his son. He that believeth on the Son of God has the witness in himself that he that believeth not God has made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. That is when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the record that God has given to John, and John has given to us, is that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ grants you life and grants you eternal, everlasting life. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. Revelation chapter 1, I'm reading verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, that means in persecution, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's because of bearing witness for the Lord Jesus Christ and as the reason he suffered this persecution. Revelation chapter 19 verse 10. Revelation chapter 19 looking at verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. That is, when the spirit of prophecy came upon those apostles and those people that the Lord revealed himself to so that they can pass it on to us. 
That was the revelation and the bore record. And actually, it is the Holy Spirit that is bearing the record through them. John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse 27. John chapter 15. Let me back up to verse 26. And when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he, the Spirit, shall bear, shall testify of me. Now verse 27. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Acts 22, verse 15. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 22, verse 15. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. Here the Lord was talking to Paul the Apostle. And was telling Paul the Apostle after the Lord had been revealed unto him that he will bear witness that Jesus Christ is Savior. He will bear witness that Jesus Christ is the one appointed of the Father. It's the only way and the only door that leads to life eternal. That Jesus Christ is the one that has been given for our salvation. That Jesus Christ is the one whose blood will cleanse us and purify us and cleanse us and make us holy and sanctified. Isn't it Paul that gave us the revelation? Jesus Christ that he might sanctify the people. He suffered without the gate. Let us therefore go outside the gate bearing his reproach. I come now to point number three. The reward of justified just Christians. The reward of those who are made just because they are justified, justified by faith. They become Bible-believing Christians and there is transformation in their lives because of the power, the transforming power of the word of God in their lives. What's their reward? Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Here we find blessedness. It says blessed. Who are these people that are blessed? Number one, blessed is he that readeth. And that means when the revelation was written, it was taken to the various churches, unto the angel of the church in Ephesus, unto the angel in the church in Smyrna, unto the angel in the church in Pergamos, unto the angel of the church in Tatira, unto the angel of the church in Sardis, unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia, unto the angel of the church in Laodicea. And then the thing was given to each of those leaders, of those, angel, of those churches. And then he, the leader, will stand before the congregation that, and read, he that readeth an individual. And then he doesn't stop there. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear. Who are those people? One, the immediate members of those churches, just like you now, as we're sitting down, and you're hearing the word of God, he that readeth, that's the person standing here, and they that hear, those are the people sitting down there. But it doesn't limit to that. It says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches, which means those of us who are here today, 2,000 years after, that now we're hearing and he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. As we're hearing the word, even now, it says, number one, he that readeth. Number two, they that hear. Now, here is the climax of it, and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. And you see, the blessing actually comes upon the people that keep. The things that are written there. Now, the word keep. When you see that 
in the word of God in the Bible. There are three meanings to the word keep. Number one, when you're told to keep something, to guard it, to protect it, not to allow it to slip away from you. Guard it, keep it. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. The use of the word keep, to gird. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Guard it, protect it, preserve it. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14. To keep, to gird. That good sin which was committed unto thee, keep, guard, protect, preserve by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Number two, there is a second meaning of the word keep, and it means to obey, to obey. And look at First John to see the meaning of keeping in the sense of obeying. First John chapter 2, Reading from verse 3. And hereby do we know, hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. That's to obey. To keep his commandments. He that says, I know him, and keepeth not, <coughs> and obeys not, his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Whoso keepeth, that's obeying, whoso keepeth, obeyeth his word. In him verily is the love of God perfected, hereby knowing that we are in him. Now verse 6. He that says he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. That gives you the second meaning of the word keep. It means to obey. Chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 22, First John. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments. Let's to obey. We obey his commandments. And do those things that are pleasing in his sight. That's the third meaning of the word keep, and it's to treasure. To hold as precious, to hold as peculiar, and to treasure that thing. Proverbs chapter 4. In Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. And verse 21. Proverbs 4, 20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Hide them somewhere. Put them somewhere. That nothing, nobody, and no circumstance will be able to touch it, treasure it. That's what he's telling us. You're keeping it. You're treasuring it. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Verse 19, to keep, to treasure. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. She treasured them, appreciated them so much. And so she treasured them in her heart. And so as you come to Revelation chapter 1, and you're looking at verse 3, it's telling us that there's something we have to do. If we're going to be blessed, blessed is he that treateth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things, obey those things, treasure those things, get those things, which are reaching therein, for the time is at hand. Would you notice that this word, blessed, appears actually seven times in this book of Revelation. And the number seven symbolized completeness and fullness and perfection. 
which means the fullness of blessing, the perfection of blessing, entire, complete blessing will come to that one that hears the word, that one that reads the word, that one that keeps, obeys the word of the Lord. Uh, look at Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. 14, 13. It says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed, that's the word, that's the word, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. If you are faithful now, if you are loyal to the Lord now, if you are trustworthy now, if you are righteous and holy now, then it says their works do follow after them. Revelation chapter 16 verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. That means he'll come unannounced, suddenly. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. The blessedness is on the people that are watching. You watch, you are vigilant over your character. You are vigilant over your behavior. You are vigilant over your comportment. You are vigilant over your decisions. You are vigilant over your plans. You are watching so that the Lord will not come upon you unawares and you, he will not come to you when you are not ready. You are ready every time, prepared every time. But blessed are those people that watch and keep their garments lest they walk naked and people see their shame. In Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19, verses 8 and 9. The blessedness of remaining pure and righteous and holy. Revelation 19, verse 8. It says unto her, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And it says unto me, write it down, write. Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it says unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. The blessedness of sitting with Christ on the throne and reigning with the Lord. But you know his promise to the people that are holy. Blessed and holy. And then in Revelation chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 7. Revelation chapter 22, verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. It's always been like that. The blessing of the Lord has always been on the people that obey the word of God. Not just the people that go to church or the people that carry the Bible or the people that pretend to be following the Lord, but the people that obey the word of the Lord. Luke chapter 11 verse 28. Luke 11 verse 28 in Luke 11 verse 28 it says but he said ye rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it that's why you need grace in your life that's why your prayer life should be oh Lord help me help me so that I'll be obedient to your word because I know the blessing is upon the people that hear your word and they keep your word and they obey your word. Psalm 112. In Psalm 112, I'm reading to you from verse 1. It says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. And that does the blessedness. The blessing comes upon the people that delight in the Lord and in the commandments of the Lord. In verse 6, surely. It shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting the Lord. Those are the people that are really blessed of the Lord. Come back to the New Testament, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 37. 
Luke 12, verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet. And he will come, will come forth and serve them. James chapter 1, verse 12. James 1, verse 12. The blessedness of the people that follow the Lord with a sincere heart. The blessedness of the people that serve the Lord in all circumstances in life. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth trials, troubles, temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. You see the blessedness in the scriptures, and you see the people that are blessed, and you, I pray this year you'll be a candidate of the blessing of God in Jesus' name. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. He said, and he signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that treateth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. I invite you today, I invite you all the days and all the weeks ahead of us that you will come and hear. Then you'll pray and have the grace to obey and blessings will never stop in your life. Why don't you rise up and say, Lord, give me the grace. Give me the grace. I will not only hear, I will have the grace. I will have the strength. I will have the power to be obedient to your word. And then your blessing, your blessing will be upon me. 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 Keep the word of God. Obey the word of God. You are going to pray. I'm not going to release you if you don't pray. Don't think I'm going to be in a hurry and release you because you are quiet. You will open your mouth because my teaching is not enough. If you do not pray, you pray it in, you soak it in, you sink it in. You allow it to transform your life and change your life. And if there is no evidence that you are going to keep it, you are going to obey it, then we have not finished, we cannot finish. We only finish when I see that you pray that the word will come into you. And the word will transform your life. And the word will change your life. And the word will turn you around. You have heard it already. Now you want the grace to be able to keep, to treasure, to guard, and to obey the word of God. The blessing comes when we have the grace to obey. The blessing comes when there is transformation, a turning around. The blessing comes when we can see the effect of the watch in our lives. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear, and they that keep the watch of the Lord. Reading it is not sufficient. Hearing it is not sufficient. Keeping it, keeping it, keeping it, obeying it. That's what is important. We have not finished. We have not finished until we pray it through. Until we pray it in. Until the blood of Jesus Christ comes upon our soul, comes upon our heart, transforms us, and gives us the grace and the strength and the power to be obedient to the word of the Lord. That's the way it ought to be. That's the way it ought to be. The blessing comes upon the people that obey, upon the people that keep the word of God. Will you pray that this year you'll treasure the word of God? You'll appreciate the word of God. You'll delight in the word of God. Will you pray that this year, that this word will be like unto you, a treasure hidden in the field, which a merchant man found, and he sold everything that he had, that might buy the field and get the treasure. Will you treasure the word of God this year? Gird the word of God this year? Hold on to the word of God this year? Exalt the word of God this year? 
appreciate the word of God this year and obey and obey and obey and apply the word of God this year to your personal life. Blessed, the blessedness comes upon the people that obey the word of the Lord. Oh, that the Lord will give you the grace. Oh, that the Lord will give you the grace. Oh, that the Lord will give you the strength and the power to endure temptation, endure trial, and to be obedient to the word of the Lord. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord to help you. That you'll not just be hearers of the word only. But you will be doers of the word. That we will not be hearers of the word only. We'll be doers of the word. Coming is not enough. Coming is not enough. Hear it. Hear it. Hear it. Then ask grace from the Lord to do it. Hide that word in your heart. That word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That I might not sin. That I might not sin. That I might not sin against thee. That's why we study the word of God. Let the word work out righteousness and holiness in your life. Let the word of God work out righteousness and holiness in your life. Let it change the habit of just hearing the word of God and then getting up and running away. Don't go yet. Don't go yet. We have not finished. Don't go yet. We have not finished. Stay there and pray. Pray it in, pray it in until something happens in your life and you will never be the same again. Hear the word, keep the word, obey the word. Tell the Lord, you need grace in your life, grace in your life, to be obedient to the word of the Lord. Talk to the Lord that your life this year will not remain as it was before. You will be obedient to the word of the Lord. Blessed are the people that keep the word of God, that obey the word of God. Amen. 
if our life does not change, the blessing of studying the word will not come. The blessing comes on the basis of hearing the word, having the grace of God, keeping the word of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much today. Thank you for the study you have given us. Thank you for the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you because we now see his glory, we see his beauty. Thank you, Lord, because we see his splendor. We've seen him in humiliation now, we see him in glory. We see him in exaltation now. We're asking, O oh Lord, as we go through the book of Revelation, we're praying that you reveal him more and more unto every one of us in Jesus' name. And we're asking, O oh Lord, that as you reveal him to us more and more, our hearts will change, our lives will change, our families will change. That beholding the glory and the splendor and the majesty of the Lord will make us, Lord, to have the character of Christ and the lifestyle of Christ in every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you give us the decisiveness or the purpose of heart so that we'll be coming every Monday and every week we'll listen to your word and it will transform us and transform us until we come to the full knowledge and the full replica and the and conformity into the life of Jesus in Jesus' name. Lord, as we go back home now, the people that hear us, let them see there's a difference in our lives. So they know that your word has touched us. Your word has turned us around. Your word has transformed us. And they will know that we are being in the presence of Jesus. We pray, Lord, that the past life, that we just come to hear the word of God, and we still talk the same way, act the same way, dress the same way, behave the same way, and it appears we are just hearing and the word is not making an impact in our lives. We pray that from today, it will change in Jesus' name. A grace to live, to please you, grant to every one of us. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, Wonderful. You are such a wonderful congregation. Uh, now, remember, uh, do you remember something that is taking place at this weekend? Tell me, what is it? Again? Uh -huh. Because I reserved all my praying to that covenant time. That's why, praise the Lord. That's why when you came on Sunday, do you remember when you came for a Sunday service? Did I pray? No, because I said, if I pray now and you get it, you will not come. So that's why, and I've been preparing. I'm telling you, I've been preparing. When you get there, Write all your requests. Write everything you have. Mountains are moving away. Yeah. Impossibilities are becoming possible. Yeah. You know, if you didn't love me before, when you get to that place, by the time we finish, you will have you when you you wake up in the morning, you see blessing. You in the afternoon, you see blessing. Every time you see blessing, if you didn't want to love me before, you first of all say, "I like this man." And then later, you will love me. God bless every one of you. Bye-bye. Where, where are we going to meet? I'll see you there.